everybody, and welcome to this session of Leto Lectures as we present our last lecture for the year 2020. Um, I'm very sure that when the history books are written a decade from now, two decades from now, and this particular year is looked back upon, it is going to be described as certainly the most unusual year that anyone listening to this presentation has lived through for, for a number of reasons, uh, many of which we've discussed over the past few months. But I'm also certain that as presidential historians in the future, 10, 20, 50 years from now, look at the presidential election that took place in 2020, it will probably be judged to have been one of the most peculiar, one of the most unusual, and certainly one that tested parts of the Constitution, which set out the process for electing a president in a way that those parts had never been tested before. Um, certainly, we will recognize that parts of the Constitution that up until this point in time have been described as routine, mechanistic, things involving the certification of electors who won the popular vote in state after state after state by the proper certifying authority in each state. Things like the meeting of electors, which took place on December the 14th, where the electors committed to the candidate who was certified the winner in each of the states, symbolically cast their electoral votes in their state capitals for the candidate who won. And then looking forward next year in 2021, when Congress meets in joint session on January 6th to do again what's usually been the routine, ceremonial, mechanistic work of Congress, counting the electoral votes, entertaining any objections to the totals accumulated by each candidate, declares from a congressional perspective the process is over and that the president-elect is now the president of the United States, only to be sworn in a, another American ceremony, a great example, which all around the world has been watched, sometimes marveled at, as the United States sees power peacefully transferred, sometimes from a president who can't run again for another term to his successor, or in some cases from a president seeking re-election who was defeated, who heretofore has gracefully stood by as his successor, the person who defeated him, is administered the oath of office of President of the United States by the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court at 12 noon on January um, the 20th. We don't know how yet the meeting of Congress on January the 6th is going to transpire. This will be the Congress that was just elected um, in the election on November the 3rd. And of course, we don't know whether or not President Trump is going to attend um, the inauguration of Joe Biden, who by this time has won and secured more than 270 electoral votes, and thus whose name, along with those electoral votes, has been submitted to Congress for its consideration early next year. As we've talked about in the last several elections, the final electoral vote count, 306 to 232, Biden having 36 more um, than the 270 needed 
to secure the presidency every once in a while in states that do not require electors to vote for the candidate to whom they're pledged to vote, we've seen one or two or three electors called faithless electors go rogue and cast their vote for the other candidate or perhaps cast their vote for someone who wasn't even on the ballot. So these are the totals won by now by each of the candidates, 306 to 232, but we don't know, and we probably know by the time this is aired, whether or not on December the 14th, um, one or more electors in one or more states went rogue and, and voted um, for some other candidate. But the challenge that President Trump um, attempted to, to undertake to somehow change the results in a number of states that would give him 38 more electoral votes, that's what he needs to get to 270, was an almost impossible undertaking um, from the moment he engaged in it. And again, only because of very strong, loyal supporters, only because uh, perhaps of his mastery, and that is the word, of social media and, and getting the word out, and of, call, and of course because of the proliferation of cable news channels, the use of talk radio, um, the recent arrival of Newsmax and One American News, much farther to the right than Fox News, we've seen the president again try to reconsider or have states reconsider their vote in what would have had to have been three states, among them from Georgia, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, Arizona, Nevada, to somehow cobble together 38 electoral votes that would have to be taken from Biden and placed into the Trump column, or in the alternative, to find courts or legislatures that would nullify or overturn the result of the vote in enough states that somehow could bring Biden's total below 270 and thus thrust the election into the House of Representatives, something that um, has happened before, but given the circumstances of our vote on, on November the 3rd, something that um, really never was likely to happen from that point on. So this is behind us, and, and for whatever it's worth, of course, this electoral map with 38 electoral votes for Florida, uh, Texas, and 29 for Florida, it is going to be retired. Here's another uh, blank one that is going to be retired because as a result of the census that was conducted this year and the reapportionment that will take place next year, we will see some states in 2024 with more, some states with fewer electoral votes. Now, today, we are going to utilize a lot of the momentum, a lot of the angst, a lot of the concern, um, um, a lot of the hysteria in some quarters regarding a vote that took place, of course, more than a month ago, and the attempts to still make it an unresolved vote deep into December and hopefully in terms of the president and his supporters into January, as a jumping off point to present a lecture that I've entitled Toward a More Perfect Union, um, a phrase 
coming from the preamble of the Constitution, which sort of was a, a mission statement, a way of setting out to the goals and introducing to the reader of the Constitution what that document hoped to achieve. So we know, of course, that the Constitution of the United States was written by a gathering of delegates from 12 of the 13 American states in Philadelphia in the summer of 1787. When the work of the delegates was completed and the Constitution was submitted to the states to begin the ratification process on September the 17th, of 1787, a reader would have first been confronted by these few lines that we now call the preamble of the United States Constitution. And it begins, of course, with the famous words, we the people of the United States of America, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution of the United States of America. The goal again, the first goal mentioned, forming a more perfect union. So from that perspective, we see, number one, that the Constitution is a document that was formed by initially 13 states agreeing to cede some of the powers that inherently each of them might possess to a new government, a national government that was created in the Constitution. Because individual state governments were elected by the citizens of those states, we recognize that even though the states and their delegates created the Constitution, they only could have done so with the support of the people the citizens of each of these individual states. We know that the job of writing a constitution that was palatable then to just the delegates of 13 states or the citizens of 13 states from New Hampshire to Georgia, very popular states like Virginia, to very small states population-wise, like Delaware. Heavily agricultural slave states in the South, less agricultural, non-slave states in the North was a tremendous undertaking that required um, the utmost exercise of judgment, deliberation, negotiation, and yes, ultimately compromise to produce a document that ultimately would be ratified by the legislatures of nine states so that document could become the supreme law of the land. So we know and have talked about several times this year how the Constitution created a federal system of governing, meaning that different powers and different authority to utilize those powers were given in some cases to the national government, or as we call it today, the federal government, the government created in this federal system, while all powers not explicitly 
or, or even implicitly given to the national government, the federal government, were reserved to the individual states and to their citizens to be dealt with individually on a state by state by state basis. So we would watch, of course, as the familiar three branches of government were created in the Constitution and recognize that Article I creates um, our legislative branch, our Congress, and creates a Congress, of course, composed of two houses, the House of Representatives and the United States Senate. We know that every state has a number of seats in the House related to the population of the state in question. More populous states have more seats than less populous states. After a constitutionally mandated census every 10 years, the number of seats a state has in the House can change. It could be increased or decreased if the state has gained or lost significant population since the census 10 years before. But the Constitution gives to each state the authority to set and determine how the number of seats that state has received is going to be apportioned. How are those seats going to be divided, in most cases, within the borders of the state in question? Um, this process known as redistricting, which has sort of created an, an ugly um, spawn uh, sometimes known as um, gerrymandering, gives each state legislature, and more particularly in most cases, the political party that controls the majority in each state legislature to divide the state up into a number of congressional districts, house districts, that the state was awarded, the only requirement really being that each district have um, about the same number of residents living within each. And we know, of course, for the most part, that state legislatures use this opportunity to create a larger number of house districts that are designed and built to favor the majority party in, in a state to the disadvantage of the minority party. This is a matter that typically is not ripe for federal intervention. The Supreme Court recently said that federal courts do not have the authority to dig into the motivations of legislatures in how they create state districts or con state congressional districts. It is the province of the state legislature itself. And from the very beginning, those individuals who were eligible to vote, who lived within a district, directly elected their member of Congress, their member of the House to go and serve in their behalf to represent their interests. Now, the second House of Congress, of course, is the Senate. And the Senate was designed in a different way. Population doesn't matter. Every state has two United States senators. And for the, about the first 130 years or so of our country living under the Constitution, United States senators were not elected by a vote of the citizens living within the state they represented, but rather senators were selected by state legislatures. Another example of this system of federalism was to enable state legislatures to choose the individuals who would represent them in the United States Senate, the Senate being regarded as the entity 
responsible for guarding and protecting the prerogative of the state as an entity, as a quasi-semi-sovereign entity, rather and compared to the House of Representatives, which served, of course, as the people's house, representing each constituent within each particular house um, district. In 1913, states ratified the 17th Amendment so that beginning with the elections of 1914, United States senators were elected by a statewide vote of the citizenry of, of the states. The states in the Senate, equal numbers of seats each, um, is an example of one of the compromises that had to be made in order to ensure that enough states would vote to ratify the Constitution. The belief, again, that by virtue of the Senate, um, being equal state by state by state in the number of seats, collectively smaller states would be able to guard and, and protect um, their interests. Article 2 of the Constitution went on to create the office of President of the United States, explaining and delineating the powers of the office, um, creating, in some cases, a special set of requirements that applied only to the person who would hold the office of President of the United States. 35 years of age, a natural born citizen of the United States, 14 years a resident of the U.S. before elected president, and then went on for whatever it's worth to design a system we know today as the impeachment um, process to remove a president accused of committing what the Constitution calls high crimes or misdemeanors in office. And we know, of course, that the Constitution also created the system the electoral college system by which, with a few modifications, and of course an expansion as more states have been added to the Union, we elect our president today. This map is reflective of the words of the Constitution and the design with some amendments of the electoral college controlling how we conducted our recent presidential um, election. Now, after delineating this system, the Constitution then goes on as another example of the federal nature of our system of government to give to the individual states the right to determine how their elections were going to be run and how each of the electoral votes that a state is given in a presidential election could be won. How was it going to be, how were they going to be um, awarded? We know, of course, that all of these numbers that we see here, the number of electoral votes that each state uh, possesses is derived by combining the number of seats a state has in the House of Representatives, which of course um, is dependent on population and can change every 10 years, and the number two, the number of senators each state has in the United States Senate. So you look at a number like Florida, 29 um, electoral votes, 
And we know that by deducting the two electoral votes that come by virtue of our two senators, Florida has 27 seats in the House. And every state we look at, we can uh, make the same computation so that we know that in very small states um, like the Dakotas, like Alaska, like um, Wyoming and Montana and Delaware, states with three electoral votes have two senators like every other state, but just one seat in the House. One House member, an at-large member that is responsible for representing every citizen of the state in the people's house, in the House of Representatives. Then the Constitution in Article 3 went on to create the federal judiciary. Um, just a couple of paragraphs only um, creating a Supreme Court, leaving to Congress and the president through the legislative process, um, the creation of lower federal courts. The Constitution does not state how many justices shall sit on the Supreme Court. That too is a product of the legislative process. Congress and presidents in quote judiciary acts um, setting these numbers, but creating in our federal judiciary, one that the framers hoped and believe would create courts that were apolitical, money honest, um, by conferring on any confirmed member of the federal judiciary lifetime tenure the ability to serve until the day you die, and a protection against what the Constitution calls diminution of salary, a protection against Congress um, retaliating perhaps against court actions by reducing judicial salaries. So once a judge is nominated by the president and confirmed by the Senate, that judge shall enjoy life tenure. A series of um, events the framers believed would create an honest and an apolitical um, federal judiciary. Now, we've seen over time the, the ramifications of how these constitutional um, branches were, were created play out for the creation of policy, um, the enactment of laws, and, and ultimately um, their interpretation by, by our federal courts. Um, we know, of course, that the Constitution gives to each House of Congress the ability to establish their own rules for governing their deliberations. And, and to make a, a long story a little shorter, from the very beginning, from the outset, the House of Representatives has been a body where any matter before the House um, passes if a simple bare majority of the House votes in favor of it. Um, the Senate, Mainly, I think, because it was a body that was created to guard the interests of the state as a whole, um, because the Senate tended to uh, be populated by people who were among the wealthier or the better known citizens of their states, and because senators served six-year terms unlike the two-year terms in the House, for a very long time, uh, up until a generation or two ago, um, the Senate was a body very much steeped in tradition and a body that in important matters 
like legislation, like important nominations that required senatorial confirmation, required supermajorities of members, more than just the bare majority, in order for a bill to eventually come to the Senate for an up or down vote, or for a nomination to come to the Senate um, for its confirmation. The Senate, for a very long time, viewed itself as the, I don't know if better is the right word, but the more august body to its counterpart, the House of Representatives. Senators have often in history referred to their body as the most exclusive men's club in the world until women began getting elected to the Senate. The world's most deliberative body the place where heated, hot legislation coming out of the House made its way to the Senate, where the Senate acted as the saucer in which that hot rhetoric, that hot matter was permitted to cool so that the calm, deliberative voices of the Senate could consider it. The Senate, a body which for a very long time, to a lesser extent today, guaranteed to each member the right of unlimited debate. A lot of talking, a lot of bloviating, a lot of deliberation, cool the hot matters that had come into that body from the House. Eventually, um, the Senate would create a device to end circumstances when at once a single member could talk and talk and talk, filibuster a bill denying the Senate a right to take an up or down vote on it. We would see a process created known as the cloture process, where today, regarding bills before the Senate, 41 or more members of the Senate could prevent debate on that bill from beginning and later in the process could, by a vote of 41 senators, prevent an up or down vote on that bill taking place on the Senate floor, which, and you talk about confusing, if a bill makes it to the point where there is an up or down vote on the Senate floor, all that's necessary to pass it is a simple majority vote. So the hurdle is overcoming the need for 60 senators to vote to cut off debate, eliminate the possibility of a filibuster, and then move to a straight up or down um, vote. We live in a time in the last 20 years where the filibuster has been used and employed exponentially more frequently than at any other time in our history. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the consequences of hyperpartisanship, and, and in particular, the, the introduction of identity politics to political um, partisanship, and recognize that there are not many matters these days that are able to overcome that 60 vote hurdle in order to get a clean up or down vote for passage on the floor of the Senate. Put another way, there have been in both presidential um, administrations that were Democrats were the president, 
in administrations where Republicans um, uh, occupied the presidency, there has been a prevalence of at least this 41 um, um, vote contingency, usually of the out of presidency party, too willing, too frequently to utilize this device, the, the filibuster. If we were to take a, a, a ridiculous example, but, but it's illustrative at this point, again, the framers believed giving every state two seats in the Senate was a way to ensure that small states would be confident enough to ratify the Constitution. Their powers would not be in, encroached upon. Every state was given two Senate seats. So if we take the 20 least populous states, among them they have, of course, 20 times two, 40 senators, and one of the two senators from the 21st least populous state, that gets us to the magic number for successfully filibustering 41 senators. And the example I just gave, the 21 least populous states combined possess 11% of the country's population as a whole, a little more than 30 million people live in our 20 least populous states, less than the population of California, whose population is 40 million. So we see, of course, the, the ease by which um, um, filibusters can, can occur. Now, in addition to this, we've seen in the last 10 years, first Democrats and now Republicans utilize a device that exists only in the Senate, given a ridiculous, exaggerated name, the nuclear option, to change the rules of the Senate which ironically, in order to change the rules in the Senate, only a simple majority vote is necessary. If all 100 senators are present, for, for the purpose of this example, 51 senators were all that would be needed in order to change the Senate rules. Back in 2013, when Democrats controlled the majority, barely, um, the majority leader then, Harry Reid, triggered the nuclear option after Republicans, led by Mitch McConnell, who was then the Senate minority leader, used the filibuster to prevent votes being taken on judicial nominees and cabinet um, nominees put forward by President Obama couldn't get to the point where these judges or these cabinet nominees received an up or down vote. So Harry Reid went through the verbal colloquy that eventually saw the Democrats in the Senate change Senate rules, no longer permitting cabinet nominees or judicial nominees except nominees to the Supreme Court from being filibustered. The rule was enacted, and soon, of course, all of these log jams of lower federal court judges were cleared, they were confirmed. Whichever cabinet appointments had been filibustered um, were confirmed, and this rule change carried on into the presidency of Donald Trump. Following President Trump's surprise victory 
At least I was surprised. Maybe some of you were not. Um, in 2016, right about this time four years ago, we began hearing the names of the people that President Trump was going to nominate um, to serve in his cabinet. Uh, President Trump, then candidate Trump, had already released a, a list of 25 people from which he would choose to fill vacancies on the Supreme Court if a vacancy ever occurred. And of course, we know he came into office in 2017 with Antonin Scalia's former seat having been kept open by Majority Leader Mitch McConnell um, from the time of Scalia's death in February of 2016 all the way into the early weeks of the Trump presidency in early 2017. So a whole list of individuals from Rex Tillerson to Generals Mattis and General um, John Kelly, individuals like Betsy DeVos and Ben Carson um, and Rick Perry, um, um, Wilbur Ross, and many others came forward as President Trump's nominees to fill important cabinet positions. And because Republicans controlled a majority of seats in the Senate, they were all confirmed. The Democrats no longer had the ability to filibuster these nominees by virtue of a rule the Democrats had promulgated just four years before. Um, after President Trump nominated Neil Gorsuch to fill the seat still vacant after Scalia's death, hearings were taken, and when the time came to vote up or down to confirm Judge Gorsuch, the Democrats began to filibuster that nomination because that was the one nomination, those to the Supreme Court, that could still be filibustered, at which time Mitch McConnell, you know, took out the playbook of Senate rules, went through this colloquy of of statements and motions, the result being the nuclear option once again employed and the Republicans, by virtue of the rules change, preventing the filibustering of any presidential nominee to the judiciary, judiciary including Supreme Court justices. And we know that in four years as president, uh, Donald Trump has been extremely fortunate. Um, he has now um, nominated three of the nine justices that sit on the Supreme Court. And because the Democrats could not filibuster, they were all um, confirmed. So this is, again, the, one of the manifestations, one of the consequences of this Senate of dis distribution of two seats per state, irrespective of population. Now, we know, of course, that states' electoral votes are also based on the number of seats a state has in the Senate. So we know that a number of states, like the Dakotas, Wyoming, Montana, Alaska, Delaware, have just three electoral votes. We look at it and say, we look at it and say boy, that's a puny number. It, it, it doesn't seem fair. Some look at it and say, well, they're big states and area. <laughs> you know, I won more area-wise in the country than my opponent did, but it all, of course, is based on population. And then we see California, 55 electoral votes. Texas, 38, Florida, 29, um, Pennsylvania, and Illinois, 20 each. 
And we might look at it and say, oh my gosh, that's a huge number. 55 versus 3. But here's the real story looking within the numbers. Way back when the Constitution was ratified and we first saw this large state versus small state um, dichotomy, um, Virginia was the most populous state in the country. It had about 17 times the number of people living in it than did Delaware in 1787. And again, that compromise um, was sufficient for Delaware, not just to ratify the Constitution, but as the smallest state, to be the first state to vote to ratify the Constitution. Fast forward to today, and we see that in Wyoming, the least populous state in the country, with 572,000 residents, California has a population 68 times the size of Wyoming, with 40 million people living there. But Wyoming, rather California, has only 17 times more electoral votes. Um, California has 17 times or so the electoral votes, 18 times the electoral votes of a Wyoming. So we look at the least populous um, states. Wyoming, 572,000. They have 190 electoral votes. Um, they have one electoral vote for every 190,000 um, Wyomians. Um, Vermont, 620,000 votes. They have um, 210,000 votes for um, each person living in Vermont. Alaska, 240,000 um, uh, per electoral vote. North Dakota, 250,000 per electoral vote. South Dakota, 290,000 for electoral vote. I don't know why there needs to be two Dakotas, but that's another argument for another time. So again, less than 300,000 in all of these small states citizens for every electoral vote. Now the flip side, the more populous states, Pennsylvania with a population of 12 million, 20 electoral votes, one electoral vote, for every 600,000 Pennsylvanians. Um, New York, um, 19 million population, 29 electoral votes, one electoral vote for every 655,000 New Yorkers. Florida, 21 million residents, one electoral vote, 29, one electoral vote for every 725,000 Floridians. One electoral vote for every 725,000 Floridians. Texas, 38 electoral votes, one for every 789,000 Texans. And again, California, its population is 40 million. It has 55 electoral votes, one for every 727,000 um, Californians. So many look at this electoral college and recognize that it is excessively tilted towards these very small, uh, sparsely populated states to the exclusion of states with larger populations. And we've seen, of course, in our history, in 1824, John Quincy Adams, in 1876, Rutherford B. Hayes, um, in 1888, Benjamin Harrison, and then more recently, in 2000 and in 2016, with George W. Bush and Donald Trump, 
the person who was elected president, who won at least 270 electoral votes, lost the national popular vote. In the case of Donald Trump in 2016, he lost it by 2.8 million votes. This year, in 2020, um, Trump has lost the national popular vote to Joe Biden somewhere by somewhere between 6 and 7 million votes. There are 30 states in our country that don't even have a population of 6 or 7 million. So this is another sign of, again, the electoral vote and how presidents are elected running counter to what today many Americans may intuitively believe should be using the national popular vote as, as a way to select our president. Um, for whatever it's worth, and this might be an example, if, if, if President Trump is, is considering another run in, in 2024, um, in 1884, Grover Cleveland was elected president of the United States. He won the electoral vote. He won the popular vote. Four years later, the Republican um, um, Benjamin Harrison defeated Grover Cleveland in the electoral vote, even though for the second straight presidential election, Grover Cleveland won the popular vote. And then in 1884, Grover Cleveland came back, became the only president to win two non-consecutive terms, and for the third election in a row, Grover Cleveland won the national popular vote as well. So, is it time to consider seriously scrapping the Electoral College system. Over the last 30 years, both parties, usually after they lost a presidential election, have made noise about this system being antiquated and a relic of a time when news and information and votes could not be quickly tabulated, calling for some type of a change. But the process to do so generally considered um, somehow amending the Constitution. We know, of course, that the framers, in order to create a more perfect union, believed that they had pretty much gotten all of the various debates at the time um, right in creating a proper governing document, but maybe believing they weren't perfect. They created in Article 5 of the Constitution a process to amend the Constitution, something that's been done 27 times in, in our history. The first 10, of course, the Bill of Rights were um, ratified in one fell swoop in 1791. We know that the 13th and 14th and 15th Amendments were post-Civil War constitutional amendments. We know that the 18th and the 19th Amendment, prohibition and universal suffrage for women, were products of the progressive era in American history in, in the late teens, um, about 100 years ago. But we also know that almost, I think, by predetermination, the framers wanted to make the Constitution a difficult process or the docu the Constitution a difficult document to amend. In order to amend the Constitution, again, 27 times it was done, two things have to occur. Think about this in the current hyper-polarized environment in which we live. Number one, two-thirds of the members of each House of Congress, 280 plus House members, at least 67 out of 100 senators, would have to vote separately in each House to pass the language 
of a proposed constitutional amendment. Supposing that happens, and that used to be considered the easier part, that proposed amendment is then sent to the states, wherein some time frame, usually spelled out within the legislation proposing the amendment, three quarters or 38 state legislatures would have to vote to ratify that amendment. When the 38th state did indeed vote to ratify, that amendment immediately would become part of the Constitution. So when we recognize that the United States House is a body that beginning in um, next year when the new House is sworn in, is going to be divided between Democrats and Republicans by 10 or so seats. Maybe something like um, uh, 225 to 210, something like that. How do you get to 280 votes to approve a proposed constitutional amendment there? And in the Senate, which may end up 50-50, may end up 51-49, may end up 52 to 48 in favor of Republicans, how in the world do you get to 67? There is no chance of any amendment um, making it out of Congress, but I suspect in particular one that would alter this process. Now again, again, there is another way. And a lot of Americans, at least um, rhetorically, wonder why and how this system can be changed. And here's one way that, that has been um, suggested. Again, we know that every state in the Constitution is given the right to determine how their electoral votes are won on presidential election day. How the 38 in Texas, how the four in Idaho, how the 29 in Florida are won. Overwhelmingly, with just the exception of Nebraska and Maine, every other state in DC have legislation awarding their state's electoral votes, winner take all, to the candidate who wins the most votes in that state, period. So we've heard a lot of noise about how Georgia or a Pennsylvania's legislature or Michigan's or Wisconsin's should come into session and change the rules enabling them to alter the way in which their electoral votes are going to be awarded or were awarded in, in 2020, that's something the Supreme Court said they cannot do. They can meet next year or the year after in any state legislature and say, we're going to change the way electoral votes are won. But citizens, for the most part, expect, I think, their votes to somehow have some more direct um, meaning in, in uh, how their electoral votes are won. In theory, state legislatures could next year meet and vote that they're going to award their electoral votes on the basis of a coin flip to take place um, when electors meet, um, in December of a presidential election year, there's nothing in the Constitution that would permit them from um, doing so. Now, more realistically, in 2006, a, an initiative known as the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact came into being. 
And it is a process whereby a number of state legislatures have already voted that their electoral votes would be awarded to the winner of the national popular vote, provided a number of states whose electoral votes total at least 270 or more choose to do so. So a number of states have already agreed that if enough states with 270 or more electoral votes agree to do it, in future presidential elections, their electoral votes would not win or take all go to the candidates who win the most votes in each state. Their electoral votes would go to the candidate who wins the national popular vote, a system which theoretically would have made Al Gore the president in, in 2000 and Hillary Clinton in, in 2016. This again expresses a preference of some legislatures to nationalize more completely and more transparently our presidential elections. Add them all up and give enough electoral votes to the candidate who wins the national popular vote to make them president. Now, as of today, this compact has been adopted by 15 states and the District of Columbia whose electoral votes total 196. The states in question who have already bought in to this interstate compact are California, New York, Illinois, New Jersey, Washington State, Maine, Maryland, Colorado, Oregon, Connecticut, New Hampshire, Hawaii, Rhode Island, Vermont, Delaware, and Washington, D.C. Add those states' electoral votes together, it totals 196. Votes or legislation to sign on to this compact are pending in the legislature's of the following states, Texas, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Virginia, Missouri, and South Carolina. If between now and 2024, the presidential, uh, next presidential election year, enough of the states that are considering this interstate compact were actually going to join it, so that taken together with those 196 that were already on board, the total number would be 270 or more. That compact theoretically and probably legally would in fact lead to the winner of the national popular vote winning the presidency by virtue of them winning the electoral votes of states that have changed their law to award their electoral votes, not to the candidate who wins in each state, but to the candidate who wins nationwide. So something that we will talk about and, and maybe consider um, uh, somewhere, somewhere down the line. So we are now um, coming to the end of again another um, year of lectures. Um, you can't see, but my house is beginning to look like um, Santa's workshop. 
Um, and I'm sure lots of us are preparing to celebrate Christmas and, and Hanukkah, uh, maybe Kwanzaa, which begins the, the day after Christmas. Um, again, as I said in an earlier lecture, thank you so much for, for your patience and, and your perseverance. I'm very, very optimistic that we are going to see um, vaccines make their way um, hopefully uh, to some place close to you. Um, if you feel comfortable taking it, if I see Anthony Fauci taking a vaccine, if I see Presidents Bush and Clinton and Obama and, and Trump and Hillary Clinton or whomever taking a vaccine, I'm going to get in line to get one as soon as I can because I hope that just as quickly and just as suddenly as the coronavirus dropped in on us at the beginning of 2020, by about a year later, by March of next year, we will be well on the way um, to a return to normalcy, on the way to better health, and even though it's not as important as good health and, 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 and the resumption of normal lives and of seeing loved ones once again, I hope to see all of you in person um, sooner rather than later. So a very happy holiday season to everyone, and we'll see you soon. Take care.